Eric, nothing can stop us. Let, let us just say that, you know, we had ideas, we had goals, we had plans. Regrets, we've had a few, but then again, too few to remember. Um, and we bounce back, and they don't see what happens behind the scenes. Um, but you and myself, we thought, hey, let's drop a little bit of knowledge, right? We we were going to show our Ferraris, our collective Ferraris that we managed to accumulate from our Masculinity in Crisis tour that's been going tremendously well. We haven't been showing up due to COVID restrictions, but we still have been charging people. And that in and of itself is kind of ingenious, our new marketing strategy. Anyways, we decided uh, humility is the mask that we will don for this episode, and let's instead return to our roots and give the people what they want, which is science, hunks talking about hunky things. What's going on today, Eric? Oh, well, what's going on for me is I just uh, feel blessed to be sitting here um, knowing I have a Ferrari in the garage underneath (laughs) me. Uh, You called it a marketing strategy. The people who we've charged without showing up or giving them any service have called it fraud. Our lawyers are Synonyms. trying to figure out what they want to call it, and that's ultimately all that matters. But yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm excited to be getting back to our roots and talking uh, that their science of guess what, folks, a an element of what is called metabolic adaptation, Whew. adaptive thermogenesis. Oh wow! Uh, it's been a long time yeah. since uh, our our dear constant colleagues, constant. always allies, yes. and always correctly uh, respected and name pronounced individuals. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about one of the the folks behind Stronger by Science, Doctor Eric Trexler. Yep, he was on. Geez, what episode was that, Omar? That must have been back thirty. The first time he was on, I think. It, yeah, like episode thirty or something like that. Yep. So we're talking more than a year ago. Yep. And uh, and we're returning. We're 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 getting to something perhaps a little more practical yep. as we discuss uh, what to do when your diet is over. Yep. Uh, and how that is often tightly tied by some folks, uh, to quote unquote metabolic adaptation and that you have to pay careful mind to that, uh, post diet. Uh, and then of course the story changes when you don the most important suit you'll ever wear your posing suit. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah. So today we got, we got some good topics. We're gonna be talking about reverse dieting, recovery dieting, the rationale behind each what the science actually potentially says, what we don't know, and then the different applications of that knowledge, as you all always pronounce perfectly, yep. uh, to different populations, such as your average boy or girl trying to get yucky and look <laughs> yucky for always, uh, versus the person who wants to get yucky and then go, you know what, I need to lose another 20 pounds and gain at least two eating disorders and a, huh. and a lightweight body image uh, issue to compete in the sport of competitive starvation. Uh, bodybuilding, uh, the only true sport on the planet. So, yeah, I think I think that's that's that, is that what we're going to talk about today, Omar. <laughs> Absolutely, there is so much to discuss, and thank you. Uh, it's it's kind of my Brooklyn accent comes out every now and then. My not Brooklyn Brooklyn accent when I say knowledge, um, it just if it it, it 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 carries a weight to it and a significance. I think it's more poignant when I say it that way. Um, we are returning to forever here, which is our forever topic. It's our tonic, they would say in music. Sure, we could talk about strength, and, and we like to pretend, and we have to f- fulfill, quite frankly, our contractual obligations to yeah, let's have powerlifters on. Oh, let's let's invite world champions. Oh, Highland Games, that seems pretty cool. What's that about? Oh, strong man, strong woman competitors. Yeah, let's talk about these strength sports because, of course, lifting isn't only about looking good. And we're towing the party line when we say these things because we do have those corporate sponsors. But at our core, it's about getting yucky, diced, juicy. Um, and to return to this, to return to what we're really about, just feels incredible. Now, Eric, before we begin, there is one thing, because we did promise last episode, which we recorded, uh, must have been weeks ago, uh, because I can mm. barely remember this, but I think we said we were going to read the one loan review from New Zealand before we get cracking. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have that available on the phone. If not, don't worry, we can make it up, or we could just completely... Uh, you know, this this is something, you know, when we were preparing this episode like five minutes ago off air that you, you could have reminded me of. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but sure, I can absolutely look it up. Um, and when, and while you do that, uh, don't worry. Yep, I'm going to just... type this up. Yep. I will just Iron say, Eric, culture. that, uh, you know, our good friends and good friend, because there's one host, as we found out, Stronger by Science, Eric Trexler, that we've always, one we've had such a, yeah, we've had such a small relationship with him. Um, and we have, we're currently feuding with, with 
a known serial killer in Danny Lennon. So what we're talking about in-depth topics, we're very careful with who we choose to bring on, which is why we thought it'd probably be best just to do a duo of this episode because that way there could be no potential fallout, no controversy, because controversy follows us. We don't attract it. It's just that when you're at the top, all eyes are looking at the top. And so that is us uh, uh, right now. So that is what we have before us. Do we have the review? You know what? The funny thing is, oh, no. uh, it's it's not recognizing me as being from, from New Zealand. <laughs> so I'm seeing our 4.9 out of 5 uh, with 429 ratings. Oh. And I just want to read a couple of Go. bangers. Go. Uh, this one is is titled, Great, dot, dot, dot. It's a one-star rating. <laughs> no. And it, no. it goes from there. <laughs> yes, is it really? Yes. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this was done on February 25th, 2021 uh, by, uh, by Red Rider 1983. Nice. Um, great year to be alive. That's, That's when I was born. Damn. So, um, so yeah, we were we, we shared a hospital bed together, and he's hated me ever since. He or she, hard to tell. Uh, great if you want to waste your time with dribble. Yeah. I've listened to several episodes, yeah. different subjects. Yeah. I've had some experience in. Unfortunately, they have proven you don't have to know a lot to get a doctorate. Some of the guests have been great, though. Hey, maybe the guests would be interested in taking over. So that's just uh, <laughs> it's just just a, just a great review that's out there. Eric, I'm gonna have so to thank stop you so you right much. There. No, that 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 offends me because sure, if they don't like the banter, if they're like, oh, uh, Omar, maybe you're joking a little too much because we want to get into the deep dive. If if they're really about the topics, mm-hmm. they want mm-hmm. just the mm-hmm. science, right? They want they basically want you to read a, a research review with uh, you know no humor, uh, no personality whatsoever. I get that, but for him to come at you and say it's hey. clearly easy to get a doctorate, what? I mean, you just pay for it, really. Yeah, I didn't do much else. Yeah. But uh, wow. here, here's one you'll like. Uh, th- this one's a five star. We're, okay. we're, we're balancing the forces. Okay, uh, the Sith Lord is being balanced, and but I think you'll still be offended, uh, which sure. is the best part. Good. Uh, this is by uh, Jason Inva, yep. and this was done back in December, just three days before Christmas. So thank you for this early Christmas gift of five stars. Thank you. Canadian. Oh. Exclamation point question mark exclamation point question mark. <laughs> I'm a little shocked and misled because I thought Omar was from California due to his amazing physique and lack of calves, but now I know better. Learning has occurred. In all seriousness, great podcast, along with Stronger by Science, are always ally. Always. Uh, always. I added that. This is the best no-nonsense podcast for natural lifters. And that's right. If you take anabolic steroids, this podcast is not for you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) None none of what we said applies. The mindset, everything else... (laughs) No, not even our episodes where we specifically talk <laughs> with enhanced lifters. <laughs> That's right. Uh, science-based approach, episodes about the history of the culture, uh, which is capitalized, as it should be, and hypertrophy, great place to start for new listeners. So I, I agree with that. He didn't say, hey, go listen to the science to start. He said, listen to the culture to start. Thank you. Because what is science without culture? Very Do you want to hear more, Omar? Because I keep going. I'll hear one more, and then we'll dive right into the topic, my dude. Because I am enjoying right. that. What? What? A, <laughs> that's an, an amazing one too. <laughs> so uh, here, here's the question I have for you: Do you want another five? No. Do you want another one? Oh, or do you want one. something dead center uh, that that's a solid three that I think uh, is is probably uh, advice we should listen to three. Uh, but but that we absolutely not. Okay, cool. Please. So this one is uh, by X. Agert, uh, and it was back in 2019. Okay. Um, so you know, I'm sure we, we've this. This probably doesn't apply anymore. And and you know, dear audience, you let us know if you think this still applies or not. Generally good, but reduce all the joking and irrelevant discussions. This, <laughs> Wish we this is heard generally that two years ago. The best, the best part is that he's probably annoyed that we're reading this out loud. If he's still a listener. Uh, but this is generally this is a generally good podcast. But Omar spends far too much time telling jokes and talking about unrelated topics. Yeah. Maybe some people enjoy it. Uh, answer to that is we don't know and we don't care. Uh, but I find it a waste of time. Mm-hmm. There are often excellent guests who aren't permitted to talk enough about their area of expertise <laughs> because of the irrelevant discussions. Um, and I'll just put forth, we had a round table with three of the strongest powerlifters on the planet, yeah. and you only had to wait 25 minutes 25. before you actually got to hear them speak, yeah. because it's a round table, folks, and it starts right around yeah. where Omar and I are sitting, and yeah. then it eventually gets around the table to them. It's so, an around uh, table. We eventually get around, around to table. you. 
Correct. Yeah. So uh, it's in it's in the title. I, I don't know how to better set explanations. I'm sorry, expectations than that. But uh, thank you for that three star. It, it definitely averages to a two uh, if you uh, you know average it with the great dot 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 yeah. first one I read. Yeah. So yeah, I'll leave it there. I think I think that gives us a nice uh, you know a nice cross section. But to be clear. We're still at a four point nine out of five. Oh yeah, no, okay. so that that yeah. was that wasn't a random selection. All right, no, we 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 need to read a mix because we have to hear all perspectives. And maybe if we read that two years ago, we would have changed. We would have thought to ourselves, "Hey, maybe the formula is not working." But oh wait, we continue to grow. So do we bow to uh, the desires of the masses, or do we listen to the, our own internal compass that says just talk to each other, ignore the guests? Um, I will say that what's interesting to me, Eric, is that when we get together with our fellow uh, like-minded individuals, most of the guests, and we have discussions, how we have conversations on the podcast is more similar to how actual humans discuss things. So you'll you'll talk, you'll banter, this and that. Like even you pick the most sciencey person. So if you actually take uh, Greg and Trexer outside of doing a podcast, and you're we we shoot the shit more off the air, even if they want to talk about something versus being on the air. And so it's almost like you're being privy to not a private conversation, but a conversation that's actually taking place rather than a discourse. So it's not a lecture, it's not a lesson, it's a loose and formal discussion that does talk about very relevant topics is the way i kind of view it yeah you can get a look into the real world way that omar and i interact with people which is totally dominating the conversations <laughs> and not letting them speak so uh you're welcome that's all i got to say about that <laughs> well we well we feel great about it and what's great about our uh internal review structure is i ask you hey how do you feel about this and you ask me hey how do i feel about this and we always reach the same conclusion um and i could see no error with the way we do things that that is is that not what peer review is eric at the end of the day well as we both know we only have one peer uh <laughs> for both of us so we're doing the only peer review we can uh yeah. and you know if you have thoughts about that please share it but since you're not our peers we won't value it yeah yeah you could you could peer share review yeah you could share Boom, your thoughts right there but we're basically peerless uh besides each other atop that mountain um and with that with with our contractual obligation to you know mention yeah strength sports yes listen to the people for feedback because our our marketing manager is like hey you guys got to zip zop zoop you're not you know doing tiktok so you got to interact with the people and he always uses that same phrase the people um so that Mm -hmm. was our attempt at being relatable i don't know if it came off with that being said let us now assume the coach role, the educator role. Let's talk about recovery diets. Let's talk about the context of when some of these things might be relevant. First to uh, someone that would be more in the competitive strain, because I think that's interesting, Eric, uh, for yourself with the research and the way that you discuss uh, different variables or, or different considerations. There's kind of the hardcore, like how, how does this matter for people that are exceptionally lean, right? And then Let's expand that outside of those that compete and win that glory, okay? I don't care about what happens, the the casualties, when pursuing that. You get third place, you get a huge round of applause from me. Three out of three, there's three competitors, and you placed third, and you got on stage, and you didn't feel good about it. You're getting a round of applause, and you're getting a sword from me, my friend. So first starting with the hardcore of the hardcore, too legit to quit, and then going all the way to the general population where it's like, all right, I finished this diet. What the hell do I do? Eric... My man, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I think we're just going to maybe just gloss over the fact that you said zip, zop, zoop. Yeah. Um, Yeah, we're just going to leave it at that. So, yeah, I think (laughs) the best place to start um, is, is, is what is, you know, colloquially discussed as what one needs to do after a diet. Um, and I would say there are a couple of different camps. Some people would suggest, uh, that you need to slowly bring your calories back up. Um, and some people would suggest that you need to try to find maintenance. Uh, some people will talk about metabolic adaptation. If we talk about this in a context, like you said, of competitors, um, there is basically two dominant camps of, of how quickly calories should come back up. Um, and I think because there are different groups of people uh, with different goals and different underlying assumptions and expectations, you get a number of different messages that can sometimes seem conflicting. And it's easy if you're not necessarily a part of the group that's having the discussion. And this kind of goes back to our content creation discussion, how you have to kind of be aware of your audience that people sometimes uh, get get the wrong message. So um, 
first off, I think we need to talk a little bit about the the reason why people uh, discuss doing anything outside of the normal after after dieting, and that is what happens to you from dieting. So uh, a term that most people have heard of, metabolic adaptation, I'd say that's probably the most common uh, parlance that if you just read about why you hit a stall uh, dur during a fat loss phase or, or, or the, one of the barriers to your success. Um, this has been a relatively controversial discussion, and I think uh, a big part of that is because of the terminology, actually. Uh, metabolic adaptation is so, kind of somewhere in the middle of terminology that I like, and I've just kind of come to accept that it, it is what has been used. Uh, it used to be metabolic damage, which I think uh, the, we collectively decided, eh, that's probably not a good idea to describe a very normal adaptation to, uh, and, and temporary adaptation to, uh, to the process of, of losing weight and being in an energy deficit for a prolonged period of time. But uh, more commonly used in the, uh, the scientific literature is adaptive thermogenesis. Um, and I like adaptive thermogenesis a lot. If I had to choose my own preferred terminology, it would be energy expenditure adaptation because it requires the least amount of assumptions and it puts forth uh, the, the least amount of you know, pre-existing terminology in someone's head. I think when someone hears metabolic adaptation, they focus on me metabolic. So they're thinking this is a basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate adaptation uh, that my physiological processes in my body are, are, are reduced in some way. Damage gives this permanent negative uh, spin on it. So obviously that's problematic. But I think the word metabolic is problematic as well. Adaptive thermogenesis is better, but I don't think that's, I think that's maybe unnecessarily jargoned. And while it's technically true that, you know, pretty much any energetic process in the human body does create some heat, and that is what is the result of our energy expenditure, I think it also conjures some elements of metabolic, uh, or I should say of total daily energy expenditure, like specifically TEF, the thermogenic effect of food. So you might think it only relates to that. Um, but if we say energy expenditure adaptation, we just know that whatever the cause, the output uh, of our body, the total daily energy expenditure is adapting. Now, collectively, what all of these terms describe uh, is when your energy expenditure as a result of weight loss and dieting is less than would be predicted at your body weight. And now this is a really important point because your energy expenditure going down as you go from say, let's say 180 pounds to 160 pounds is totally normal and completely explainable without the concept of metabolic adaptation. As your mass is less, the amount of energy you need to expend to propel your body through, through space is also gonna be less. In addition, because it takes energy to turn food into energy, that's the thermic effect of food, and it's roughly about 10% of the energy you consume. So let's say you're eating 2,000 calories. About 200 calories are expended in the digestion and, uh, and, and, and creation of energy through uh, metabolizing that food. So if you go on a diet and you go from eating 2,000 calories to 100, sorry, 1,500 calories, now the thermic effect of food, even though it stayed the same at 10%, it's dropped 50 calories from 200 to 150. So those two things alone... Uh, can describe why your energy expenditure is less. So let's say you've dieted, uh, you've gone from 180 pounds to 160 pounds. In that process, you've cut your calories from 2,000. You've cut them down to, uh, to 1,500. You, your, energy, your energy intake is, um, you know, let's say 500 calories less, but your energy expenditure is also 50 calories less, and then it's declining as you lose weight. And if you were to do any one of these, uh, let's say, TDE calculations. There, there's many equations out there. If you want to calculate your energy expenditure and you plug in a 20 pound lower body weight, you'll get a substantially lower uh, energy output. A decent rule of thumb, if you want to just kind of roughly calculate uh, your, your energy needs, is you can take your body weight in pounds multiplied by 10 or your body weight in kilograms multiplied by, by, by 22. And then you can multiply it somewhere between 1.2 to 2.0, depending on how, how active you are. And that's a rough rule of thumb. So if you were just to kind of use that and do 160 versus 180 times 10, that's 1600 versus 1800 before you use an activity multiplier. So a totally normal change in your uh, energy requirements from going to 180 to 160 would be that 200 calories from dropping 20 pounds and then 50 calories from uh, getting yourself into that, uh, that energy deficit. And considering... Like if you started eating it, you were eating at 2,000 calories and maintaining 180 pounds. And these are made up numbers. This isn't realistic. In fact, that'd be pretty, pretty bad if that was all. You'd be very sedentary if that was the case. 
uh, and then you went down to 1500 calories with the adaptations I just discussed, you'd be in a small, a far smaller deficit by that point, you'd lost 20 pounds. Your energy, your energy requirements would probably only be about, you know, 1600. So you'd be in a hundred calorie deficit compared to a uh, 500 calorie deficit at the very start of your diet. And that's normal. So a metabolic adaptation is anything beyond that. And it's something that has been observed many times. And most of the controversy and debate within the scientific community is around how long does it persist uh, and what is it, what's causing it. And is it truly uh, actual you know, adaptations to BMR or is it reductions in, in other parts of, of the total daily energy expenditure equation? Um, some people have postulated uh, that, it, that part of it is BMR and that has been shown less consistently uh, and, and it's a smaller magnitude. So here's something to consider. Your total daily energy expenditure has multiple components. Like I said, there's the thermic effect of food. There's your basal metabolic rate. Uh, there's also exercise activity. And finally, there's non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT, which is basically um, anything that it counts towards activity uh, that is not exercise. And some of that is subconscious. Uh, it's not, not things you have control over. Some of it's just you know moving less, sitting more, et cetera. Um, now, while the largest contributor to your total daily energy expenditure is your basal metabolic rate. The thing that adapts the most, and we've seen this, sometimes some studies would suggest as much as 90% of the adaptations are in NEAT. So it's arguably a, a misnomer to say metabolic adaptations when BMR is adapting at most going down say five, six, seven, maybe 10%, 15% I think is the largest I've ever seen. Uh, but it's more so when we look at total daily energy expenditure uh, the largest uh, recent weight loss reduction I've seen, I think it was in uh, Rosenbaum and colleagues, 2008, was a 20% reduction. So going back to that example of someone who uh, went from an 1800 to a 1600 calorie requirement, 180 pounds, 160 pounds, uh, if you were to reduce that by 20%, that would be their, their, their new maintenance. And that would re result in a complete halt uh, of, of weight loss as you got out of a deficit during that course, which is something that people uh, observe. Now also that's the average. And if you look at when you go two standard deviations from the mean and some of these studies where they take people who have recently lost weight or sustained uh, weight loss of about 10% of their body weight or more, uh, if you go two standard deviations from the highest amount, as a quick statistical reminder, we have means in these group-based research. Uh, you know, uh, one standard deviation uh, in either direction is about a 33%-ish distance from the mean. So going two standard deviations from the mean covers about 95% of the possible uh, adapt, you know, variance you could see in that mean. Three standard deviations is close to 100%, but it's like 99.7 if I recall correctly. So if you go all the way to the, to the, ex, the extent of, of the outliers even, or close to outliers of people who experience metabolic adaptation, there are some people who are only, uh, you know, have an energy requirement of two thirds of what you might expect based on their body weight. And that's a huge change. And those are things that I've observed in the field. Um, they're certainly not common, but those people really have a rough go of it. Um, and they're, you know, that, that absolutely changes the game for them. But most people are gonna be somewhere in that range of say, a 10 to 20 percent um, and it does depend on how much weight you lose how harshly you lose it and how much of that weight loss uh, you maintain so um, that means that the story of what to do about it is different depending on if you're someone who is going to purposely regain that weight like a competitive bodybuilder who just dieted down or someone who is trying to go from being overweight to a sustainable healthy body composition for health or their own personal aesthetic goals etc so I know that was a, a bit of a deep dive on uh, on metabolic adaptation, but hopefully that's all clear, would you say, Omar? Eric, my man, I know one of my boys on fire, and let me just say you're on fire, so I'm not going to uh, interject too much. Um, I will just say that it's interesting to me when we talk about a sustainable uh, nutrition paradigm. For most people, there's this interplay that's occurring where it's like, wait, I lost all this weight. I'm doing well, you know, I've reduced my calories, and now I've lost 20 pounds, I'm eating less than I have before, I feel hungrier, and I want to talk afterwards about the hormonal interplay, things like uh, leptin, and, and basically uh, trying to give people the best possible outcome after a diet to make it more sustainable, but it's fascinating because you're in kind of this crucible 
where you've lost the weight, you feel like you're doing well, you're eating less than you ever have before, fat loss then is slowing down, and now you're dealing with some of the ramifications of that longer-term dieting where you feel more ravenous, you feel more hungry typically, and so you're just looking for that W. Like How, how do I merge from out of this into something that I would be somewhat happy with? So all I'll say, uh, my man, keep going, uh, because I think it was uh, great to cover everything up until this point. Like, okay, now we're, now we're losing weight. What do we do? considering the context of uh, the person. For sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. And for anyone who wants a more in-depth look at uh, metabolic adaptation, I just want to make sure we were on the same page. Yeah. Definitely check out that episode mm. uh, back, episode 30 we had with Dr. Trexler. Yeah. So um, now the interesting thing about quantitative nutrition science is that we tend to ascribe um, mechanisms to outcomes uh, when we can measure them. And, and that's just kind of a natural bias of quantitative science. The easier something is to be measured, the more it is likely to be focused on, uh, manipulated, and have uh, hypotheses and, and, and interventions ascribed to it. So it is harder to measure um, things like prospective food consumption, um, changes in disinhibition, restraint, uh, food focus, and eating behavior, because they are more varied uh, there. And you can even see sometimes that someone will have a change. You mentioned leptin, uh, and, and there's also ghrelin. These are, are some of the, the overriding hormones uh, that are related to signaling for, for overall energy availability or an energy deficit. Uh, and you know higher levels of ghrelin are, correspond to higher levels of hunger, but they're not the only uh, hormones out there. If you ever want to look at satiety, and hunger, it's an incredibly complex relationship. And sometimes you'll see changes in leptin or ghrelin that don't actually correspond to behavior or uh, perceptions of hunger and fullness. Uh, there's, a, I'm not going to go through all the biochemistry of hunger because A, I can't. But even if I was to mention the ones that I'm familiar with, they would be just a small uh, picture of it. But essentially, uh, we have looked pretty in depth at the actual changes in energy expenditure. And some people have postulated, hey, maybe the people who struggle the most with weight loss maintenance are those who are a couple standard deviations from the mean or more and see these large reductions. Uh, and while I would never deny that that contributes, I think what you pointed out and what you brought up, which are the changes in food focus, uh, the changes in, in mood state, uh, energy levels, and the drive to eat, which all do change substantially from weight loss, are primarily what we see driving, uh, you know, weight regain after weight loss. And uh, there's there's some great reviews about this. Uh, there's one by McLean. Uh, there's a number by uh, Rosenbaum, Label. Uh, there's there's some great work out there that goes into specifically why we see weight regain, and and a huge component of it is that your drive to eat goes up quite substantially. Uh, and anyone who's lost a lot of weight uh, knows that they really have to do a lot of behavior change to sustain it. And I think one of the places where the fitness industry is complicit in the failure of, of weight loss approaches is that they focus on the short term. Uh, they focus on quick fixes. And if anything, they, they, they prey on the fact that you get to be a repeat customer uh, if you try to lose that same 20 pounds 10, 10 times over time. Uh, 10 times over the span of your life. And each time we can pitch you a new solution. You know, going back to uh, when we had Dr. Ben House on, the, the sexy mechanism plus personal story uh, plus, you know, rebelling against the, the, the tradition. Um, you know, that, that, that's just a, a, a one, two, three punch knockout uh, that, can, that can hook people again and again, unfortunately. So, you know, if people have tried keto, if people have tried, uh, you know, low fat, if people have tried, you know, more extreme crash diets, they will invariably have some decent success with losing weight, uh, but it will make the, the rebound very challenging because ultimately when we look at some of the things that correlate to maintenance of lost weight, it are things that are true lifestyle and behavior changes. Uh, people who are now consistently exercising, doing resistance training, and cardiovascular training. Uh, it's people who started tracking and quantifying their food and kept doing that in some way, having some way of staying uh, you know, objectively uh, aware of their intake and also sometimes monitoring their scale weight changes. And this is a tough thing. You know, this is why there's been the rise of, which we had you know, Gabrielle Fondero on to talk about Dr. Fondero. She talked about diet versus anti-diet culture many times. And these are, I would argue that these are uh, two separate issues, but they are related. Um, and it's important to keep them separate because uh, we don't want to think, uh, we don't want to take a fatalistic approach to this. Uh, if we go, look, 
um, you know, some of the things that come along with dieting and trying to lose weight cause psychological harm, then we should not try to address obesity. Because unfortunately, you know, that, that's a serious health concern. I do think, though, we need to take a different approach. Whatever we're currently doing is not working um, for the majority of people. So why I say that is that some of the same things that seem to relate to people who can maintain that weight loss and others uh, can cause uh, psychological harm. You know, always tracking and always weighing your food, if that's done in a more obsessive manner uh, or if it's, if it's replacing some of your intuitive signals, uh, your, your natural body signals for, for hunger and satiety, uh, that can cause issues that we see. So nonetheless, I guess what I'm getting at is that we do see that there are certain behaviors that are required to maintain lost weight. And um, there are some other hints that we've talked about in the literature that go to taking a more long-term framed uh, lifestyle and behavior change approach. Uh, like one of the things that's quite interesting about the first uh, true diet break study we saw by Byrne and colleagues in 2017, and uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Omar, but a you know a, something you didn't expect w w that you experienced is that diet breaks essentially give you the opportunity, uh, you know, if we completely divorce it from any concept of improving metabolic adaptation or anything like that. Uh, one thing that Byrne found is that the six-month follow-up, the individuals who used diet breaks had maintained significantly more of their weight loss compared to baseline compared to the group that did not do diet breaks, who did not have a significantly different weight from baseline, unfortunately. So they regained the majority of their lost weight, which did not occur in the in the folks who were two weeks on the diet, two weeks off. So I know you've talked about how that essentially gave you the ability to not be as hungry, uh, to get back to kind of quote unquote normal. And also, this is something I experienced as a personal trainer. Um, when someone is trying to lose a lot of weight, they get into this mentality. At first, they're all about it and they're ready to go and they like the fast weight loss. They love the changes in their body, but they start to, you know, as the light at the end of the tunnel approaches, they start to get a little fearful. Like, wait, does that mean I always have to be eating these chicken salads that just have, you know, salt and pepper on them? And, you know, like whatever, not that I was encouraging my clients to do that, <laughs> but whatever uh, dietary approach they were doing that felt sustainable in the short term to get them where they wanted to go, they had the perception that that needed to be their new life. And that essentially results in this kind of white knuckling that can only last so long. A diet break helps you understand that, hold on, I'm, I'm currently in a deficit. I can actually increase my calories 300, 400, 500, 700 calories, depending on your approach. And you actually get the opportunity to try that out in a more controlled environment because you know that this is a pit stop. You're not experiencing that same lashback that you have after really grinding yourself into dust. So it's easier to follow, say, eating 2,000 calories after eating 1,500 calories than it is after just barely limping across the finish line on 1,500 calories and then finding yourself eating 4,000 calories every weekend. Um, so you get to practice maintenance. You get to hopefully restore some of the normal behaviors in relationship with food before then kind of going you know, back under. And I think especially if it's framed in that manner, that can allow people to have a much better chance uh, at, at weight loss maintenance. So anyway, that's 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 a tangent. I don't want to get this to be talking about diet breaks or, or uh, intermittent dieting strategies. Um, but I think um, when we look at this research, we see that sure, uh, metabolic adaptation uh, is a part of the equation of why people regain lost weight. But I don't think it is even on my top three list. Uh, I think those are all related to uh, hunger, uh, and, and a lack of behavior change and not necessarily taking a long-term view uh, with, with the, how the diet was set up and progressed over time. I don't know if you would agree with that, Omar. This man's on fire today. So we're going to get to the origins of the recovery diet and its intended function or uh, why it even came to be. I do want to say uh, very quickly that to uh, paraphrase a quote from the latest Justice League edition, we will use the old ways. Well, the old ways don't work. I mean, I saw recently, and I'm trying to throw no shade, but our man, The Rock, D-Rock, who, Eric, what's my relationship with The Rock just before we go on? Cordial. Ah. Uh -huh. I think it's 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 better to ask what is the Rock's relationship with Omar, and I I would Don't. say, uh, I mean you're over at his house yeah. more often than he's over at yours, so yeah. so I I would say, you know, maybe he doesn't get the hint that you guys aren't that close. <laughs> he just keeps calling. That's so I, I know you guys are, are are close friends, but I do sometimes wonder if he thinks you're you're more than that. So I can say this uh, with love then because it's said with nothing but love. Um, but he was recently on a show and I uh, saw it and he was talking about once again the idea. 
what I would describe as low food satisfaction on a regular basis that leads him to splurge. And he posted, he has on his Instagram, and we see these patterns, Eric, which is what I find so fascinating is your background in now uh, research, but also being a trainer, a coach, working with top level competitors. You see in the trenches what's going on. You see whether or not it's working. And then you also take a look at what the current research shows and you try and blend both of them. Anyways, he's doing the old school style where he's just dieting hardcore, like basically no carbs, whatever, throughout the week. And then every weekend on Saturday, he'll allow himself to eat anything day. Uh, and and it, it falls to the point where he's eating 10, 15,000. He showed he had 30 cupcakes. Like just just an amount where you look at this, Eric, and you could tell this is not uh, sustainable. There's another guy, uh, quickly, a Hollywood actor, Kumail, um, who is preparing for a role, got super lean. And there you can look this up. It's, he was on Jimmy Kimmel. And he had been dieting for eight months straight, following his trainer and jimmy kimmel decided to tempt him and they lowered like a cake in front of him and when i say eric he lost his mind it's not even an exaggeration these aren't sustainable paradigms and i guess a small bit of irritation that i have of some people that might either uh, poo poo or zip zop zoop uh, let's say recovery diets or things like uh, <laughs> diet breaks or uh, 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 attempting to be uh, uh, moved towards a more sustainable nutrition paradigm isn't all of our collective goals to help people succeed and succeed more often? And shouldn't a lot of our choices be influenced by outcome-based decision-making? So it's not like, well, if a client follows this, they're going to get this result. It's like, well, what happens when we run 100 people through this experiment of what you're saying? What actually happens? It's like, oh, well, if, if only they – I think sometimes there could be almost too much emphasis on self-ownership. Like, oh, if only they had uh, you know, a more, a more control. If only they had more dedication, they wouldn't have let this happen. And this reminds me of things I would tell myself. Uh, when I would be training for strength, some of the recent revelations I had was like, wait a second, uh, you know, if only I didn't get injured, I would be getting so much stronger. Like I could handle the volume, like psychological, Eric, it's no, mentally it's no problem. Recovery even, I'm able to do, but you know, something, ah, my back, I, I, I pull on my back. If only that didn't happen. I'm like, no, that that's one of the features of what you're doing. And that's actually the consequence of what's happening. And so I think moving towards something where you have a better chance of succeeding and understanding actually uh, the person to give them uh, a, an approach that will more likely arrive uh, uh, at their destination, man, what a revelation so all i'll say before uh, you go on my man with the recovery diet is that when i move towards some diet breaks of something entirely different uh versus uh, some of the approaches before it did feel like a cheat code for myself personally because it felt easier than what i had typically experienced before and the way i kind of uh, uh conceptualize it in my head this makes this challenge, this current challenge, if it normally feels like a 7 out of 10, well, now with this approach, it kind of feels like a 5 out of 10. It better equips me if I want to handle potentially bigger and bigger challenges. It allows me to have that scope where it increases, therefore, my confidence. So now I'm not only looking at the vista that I could see before me. I'm looking at a higher and higher vista because now my tool set, I'm better able to tackle the goals I see before me. So for me, it's almost a freeing up when you have some of these opportunities uh, at your disposal. So yeah, I, I can't say uh, high enough things if anyone wants to laugh go ahead and check out uh, kumail losing his shit over a cheat like actually eric it's kind of sad because we've both been there when i did a, a ketogenic diet 11 years ago and the food focus i had was absurd like absurd um i i saw myself in him from 11 years ago i'm like ah this this isn't healthy man that's unfortunate yeah. well um yeah I, I think but i think you said that really well and, and one thing i think we're we trend towards uh, in the evidence-based kind of outcome-focused, um, you know, hardcore community, if you will, uh, is is being a little too reductionist. You know, there's the assumption that mentally we've got it on lock, uh, but but it is the, uh, the the physical things which which are the barrier to our willpowers, and we just need to bend our wills to to fix those things, um, and. I'm not denying the fact that, you know, athletes and bodybuilders have tremendous willpower, but um, everyone's will breaks eventually. It's kind of like that, that, of course, the thing that actually no one knows the answer to except for, you know, people who have been in war that everyone breaks under torture. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, I, I have really, really no uh, frame of reference for that um, as to most people who repeats it or see it in a, on, a, on a movie. Uh, but, <laughs> but I do think it, it is a, a decent kind of way to... Uh, analogize uh what, what like trying to to white knuckle it on a diet is like that you either develop some kind of weird 
weekend binging behavior or you are actually in this kind of I, I, I gain weight, I diet again, I gain weight, I diet again. And most of the time people see me somewhere in this, this semi lean position. Um, but it it's it's just simply not sustainable in most cases trying to get to a place that your body doesn't want to be or trying to use unsustainable methods to get there. And um, going back to diet breaks real briefly, you know, this is absolutely an emerging field of research and we don't fully understand how it affects things uh, like uh, long-term energy expenditure changes uh, or, or body composition uh, or performance with any kind of surety. But the current data we have, and big shout out to Jackson Pios, who's been on the podcast mm. and the research he's done, as well as uh, future do uh, Dr. Jackson Pios, I should say, as well as uh, Dr. Campbell. Um, but some of the research that they've, got, they, they've done right now uh, that is an abstract form coming out of Dr. Campbell's lab and recently published, which I had the honor of being a part of by Jackson Pios, uh, the consistent finding is that there are beneficial effects on uh, disinhibition, uh, satiety, and hunger, but inconsistent effects uh, on actual changes in performance body composition or strength and things like that. So the the one finding we are pretty sure of when it comes to intermittently going back to maintenance while, while doing a diet um, that has been confirmed by multiple lab groups now, um, and I would even argue by Byrne and colleagues as well based on that six-month follow-up, is that it seems to make the dieting process easier. Um, and that, I think most people go, oh, see, dieting bre diet breaks are bullshit. They don't actually help you maintain more muscle. It's like, well... <laughs> I don't know if that's actually the problem we're dealing with. Like we're, we're okay at maintaining muscle while getting really, really lean. You know, some people do it better than others and you can definitely, you know, do some things to alter it. And I've done a lot of, you know, research and writing in that area, but man, uh, making the diet process easier and giving people the ability to, you know, sustain their hard work instead of feeling like all of a sudden they don't have the willpower and, and feeling this loss of identity and, and undoing a year plus of work and only having, you know, an eating disorder or a body image disorder to show for it, that's a much bigger problem. And I think ultimately we, we really undervalue um, the, the sustainability and the ease that we can modify these things because they do affect everything. It should be holistic, not reductionist in the way we view it. So anyway, with that, putting a pin in that, um, now I think we need to talk about, okay, what do we do when the diet is over? We have experienced some level of metabolic adaptation, uh, but we've experienced a pretty high degree, although it is variable between individuals, of now food focus mm -hmm. and a drive to eat that is more than likely to put us into a surplus and start heading back the opposite direction. And that's where we, we come in with the, the main topic of today's discussion of reverse diets or recovery diets. So... Now, I'm going to focus a lot more on the competitor here or someone trying to get really, really lean because it is actually where I think we have more clear answers. Uh, if I had all the answers for you on how to maintain weight loss uh, with someone who was previously uh, obese and they got to a, a place of, of, a, of a healthier body weight and they maintained it, um, and I was like, yeah, here's what you do, step one, two, three, then we, we wouldn't, you know have a society with, with, with higher rates of obesity today, because that would be an easy, easy answer. But that's not the case. And I wouldn't be so arrogant as to presume uh, that I have the answers for, for everyone, or even a majority of people for how to sustain weight loss. I will give some data and some, and some, some anecdotes at the end, but we're going to focus on more what I think is a little clearer is what to do when you've gotten really, really lean, like stage lean, and, and what you're trying to do afterwards. So Enter the reverse diet. This came around, I would say, late 2000s, maybe even before 2010. I think it was first discussed. Uh, I remember Berto trying out uh, a reverse diet in 2008, his second contest season. And essentially what he did was he slowly started increasing macros, slowly starting increasing you know, carbs uh, and every once in a while fat and slowly reducing uh, the, uh, the cardio. Um, and the idea was that um, the primary driver of some of these metabolic adaptations was the diet itself, right? Uh, was was the, the actual change in calories and that you would see a slow recovery uh, after uh, your, your weight loss period and getting really lean of energy expenditure and that you don't want to outpace it. And if you kept pace with it, you could both stimulate it to go up and also prevent fat gain. And you could walk around at basically your off-season calories while being close to stage lean or at least leaner. I think what we've come to understand uh, is that some portion of what we experience is related to the lost weight itself. And this makes sense. If you look at, uh, you, you mentioned leptin earlier, uh, Omar. Leptin is, is one of the, the, the primary master quote-unquote hormone controllers. And it uh, 
has down, uh, downstream effects on almost every regulatory hormone uh, that we have related to energy expenditure, satiety, and hunger. And uh, leptin is secreted by body fat, secreted by adipose tissue. And it has extremely strong correlation with body fat percentage. I think we're talking like 0.87, if I recall the figure right. So leaner people have far less circulating leptin uh, than people higher in body fat, which is something that, that's been, been realized through multiple lines of research. Um, counter to some of the hypotheses out there, thinking that maybe that's why some people have high body fat. So uh, I think that that's important to understand. So um, there is such a thing as being too lean, being unsustainably lean. Um, and while people have proposed the quote unquote set point model as basically the idea that everyone has a body fat set point where uh, their body will defend in either way, making you hungrier or less or less hungry, more full or less full as you go up or down in weight too far. Um, I think in, in non-animals, in humans, uh, of course, we are animals, but we have a lot of societal influences on our energy intake. Uh, it's probably better to conceptualize it as, as a settling point. That is a combination of both your behavior and your physiology and what you've habituated that results in, in the, the body fat uh, range that you defend. And most people can settle somewhere in there. And as they have been in the kind of the quote unquote game longer, they may or may not hover upward or downward if they've been using you know, strategies that are more likely to give them a negative relationship with food or they've been yo-yo dieting uh, versus, you know, adapting more and more habits that, that lead to a, a lower passive energy consumption, I'll say. So nonetheless, there's the settling point range. Um, and I think it's important to understand. Uh, I talked about Rosenbaum uh, 2008. There's some studies by Label and colleagues or Liebel. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, and they show that energy expenditure is not that different between people who recently lost that weight and people who lost it a while ago and have sustained it. And it is actually the loss of weight itself that seems to cause the majority of the metabolic adaptation. So that means that restoring our calories is going to do a very small portion of the work. Um, and because, and that goes right back to the fact that leptin is tightly correlated with body fat percentage and all the downstream effects in others. So the reality is, is that if you're getting to an incredibly lean body fat, if you're getting down to stage lean conditions, that isn't something that is sustainable uh, for 99% for of people. And there are negative consequences to trying to sustain it because you are basically keeping at bay all of your body's drive and all of the psychological effects and food focus and everything you were talking about um, with, with some approach that is probably unhealthy in and of itself uh, to do that. Um, and you're going to be in a physiologically suppressed state. We've talked about a relative energy deficiency. We've talked about... Um, all of the, the the effects that go into what's called REDS, relative relative energy deficiency in sport, and having a low energy availability, um, and that all the downstream effects. Uh, again, check out that episode with Dr. Trexler. Uh, all of that will hang out and only being minimally changed uh, by just bringing up calories, even if you do it slowly. Uh, and I think this almost this myth uh, is is perpetuated by some of the reverse dieting strategies that are, that have hung around, uh, and it's perpetuated because when you're in that state. All you can think about and all you're really focused on is A, being really, really lean because you just spent months getting there and that is your sport. Or maybe that's your kind of your obsession or your focus is to try to make yourself look ripped and jacked. And I get it. Um, but on top of that, um, you're focused on food. And whenever you look at the before and afters for reverse dieting, they show you two things. They show you the person's weight and they show you their macros. And then they show you a picture. So the picture on the left is them at their peak leanness at, at what is known colloquially on the internet, at poverty macros at a low body weight. And what they show on the right is a very small increase in weight. Um, and then very similar, maybe slightly increased body fat percentage, but looking probably slightly more muscular, at least more full, and then far higher macros. And the idea is look at that. You're eating twice as much food. Isn't this amazing? And you're just as lean, uh, but maybe a little more muscular. And now you can just walk around like that. But what people don't understand is that they have macros listed on the second picture because that's the only way they can control their food intake. And they're actually quite hungry. Um, and it is not a place of full recovery. And a lot of the times what they're seeing is just the restoration of that thermic effect of food. Uh, they're seeing some um, you know, improvement in, in the metabolic adaptation, but it's not fully restored. And the changes that we see in the energy requirement of the off-season to the in-season to the you know, post-contest recovered, we're looking at a lot of the transient stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean 
uh, that you're fully recovered. It doesn't necessarily mean that your testosterone levels are back up. It doesn't mean uh, that, that uh, a picture of a woman represents a woman who is normally menstruating again. In fact, there is one case study uh, of a female natural figure competitor who, and it described her course of weight regain after getting really, really, really lean in this, this case study that's published. Uh, and it took, she only gained, I think, five kilograms after, after getting in, in, in stage weight. That's like 11 pounds, not very much. And it was over the course of, I believe, six months. And it stated that she very slowly and purposefully increased calories to try to avoid the regain of fat. And also in this manuscript, they note that she did not have a menstrual cycle for a year and a half, despite the fact that she was eating in a surplus, probably not consistently, enough to regain those five kilograms that she lost to get in shape. So this is someone who stays too, lane and, too lean and was probably in and out of a energy deficit and a surplus in almost like this cyclical kind of recurring manner, but you know, a net surplus nonetheless. And, 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 and that, I think, obviously, it's not a uh, controlled trial. It is a case study. But that's not uncommon. And that's, I think, probably related to why there was that hormonal suppression to where it was a year and a half before we saw that menstrual cycle recover. And if you th think that's only matters for women, there are, of course, parallels. And, and that is just one marker. The whole physiology is being affected by this. So the reverse diet is one of those things where it, it kind of is a self-perpetuating thing where people who are really, really focused on being really, really lean and really, really focused on their macros, if they stay focused on that, it seems like an improvement. But if you were to actually talk to them about their quality of life, many times it is still maybe slightly better, but this, this kind of white knuckling state of trying to maintain something. And if the goal is for a competitive bodybuilder to improve season to season, it really doesn't make sense. Um, you know, staying leaner, but staying in this suppressed state uh, is, is not ideal for, for building muscle. And, and it's very, very difficult when you've been focused on staying lean for so long to commit to the process of an off season. Um, it doesn't help. Uh, and, you know, being in this terrible state for building muscle is, is antithetical to long-term bodybuilding success. And even if you just do it temporarily, that's what you do for the three to four months after competition, and then you start your off-season, you basically just delayed your off-season by a few months. Um, and I'd say more importantly than all that, that's, that's kind of the physiology and the comparison. We tried reverse dieting our clients for a few years at 3D Muscle Journey, and we had about a 90% failure rate uh, to be generous. Most people it turned into the cyclical process of blowing, quote unquote, the reverse diet. You know, they were at, let's say, 1,800 calories during the diet. We kicked them up to, say, 2,000 and dropped their cardio in half, and we slowly gave them 50 to 100 calories a week. And invariably, after a couple of weeks, without that, you know, strong driver of a competition stage to get on, uh, it was easy to rationalize and meal out. And of course, after six months of dieting, all your family members want to celebrate with you. They want to go back to your re regular social schedule. Uh, they want to connect with you. And the choice is either to maintain this this behavior that outwardly looks like, oh, like okay, now this is just an eating disorder. Like you're not getting on stage. Why are you so lean? What's the what's the point of this? You feel terrible. Um, oh, I'm reverse dieting. Well, what does that even mean? Like, wh why can't you just have a burger with me? Oh, you're right. I can have a burger. And then hating yourself and feeling like you messed up the plan. And then you know, in response to that, going back on the reverse diet more aggressively. So, you know, I, I do regret that time period with 3D Muscle Journey, but I think, you know, if you knew better, you'd do better. And now, uh, you know, at the, at the urging of my understanding of the science and also Jeff Albert's experiences, he, he coined what he was doing with his clients as, as the recovery diet, um, which was basically focusing on the recovery aspect rather than reversing the diet. And I think this came down to uh, a number of things. And, and before I keep negatively painting the picture of reverse dieting, I will say that reverse dieting came as a potential solution to what normally happens post-contest. So Omar, like you said, um, you know, after your ketogenic diet, you had a food focus that was, that was wild. How much weight did you gain and how long were you like just, just almost binge eating on a day-to-day -day basis? Man, it was, so it was a few months and I had lost, Eric, I went from, I think 180 to 155, uh, over the course of maybe 16 weeks. So it was about a pound and a half per week. And then I had plans once again of getting even leaner than that. Cause guess what? My relationship with my body. I had lost 25 pounds, but when I looked at myself in the mirror, I thought, ah, like you're lean, you can get leaner. But I decided to take a temporary break. Like I'm like, okay, I'll have a cheat day. Cheat day turns into a cheat week. Gain 10 pounds. So I would basically, I would say for six months afterwards, I would gain some weight, think oh, I got to die this back down. And it would just go back and forth, back and forth until the net effect after six months 
when I finished at uh, 155, I had gone back up to and stayed at about 170, 172. So I basically had end up, I ended up only losing eight pounds, right? Uh, over the course then, if you take a look at it, six months plus, uh, let's say 16 weeks, <laughs> like 10 months, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. And all this stuff just gets magnified when you are, are going through the competitive process. So similar story for me, <laughs> probably worse. Uh, you know, I went down from 210 to 178 uh, over the course of a January through May diet. Uh, and then by July, I was 226 pounds. So that's a 48 pound of a 48 pound gain in three months or two months. Uh, and it was it was gnarly. Yeah, two months, 48 pounds gained. And it was 95% body fat, you know, <laughs> so um, and this was 2007. So it was like pre popularization of reverse dieting, I wasn't aware of it. And I didn't have a plan. I just did what most bodybuilders do is just go out on Saturday, you binge eat, celebrate, eat a bunch of stuff. And I just couldn't stop. And I found out how I'm not, al I had probably one of the more extreme experiences, but I'm not alone by any means. Most first time competitors just blow up after their first show and some do it every single time. Um, so that obviously is not ideal. I wasn't prepared for that. People weren't talking about that. I didn't know about the, the drive to eat post-competition. And there wasn't really any strategies out there. I think, <laughs> I'm not sure if reverse dieting made things better or worse. Um, I think just being aware that that's coming and knowing maybe something should be done or planned for it is, is a good idea. Um, but sometimes I think, you know, just going out and purposely eating and just filling up for some people uh, that doesn't result in like a rebound. But I was actually 15 pounds heavier than where I started. And it was the, like the highest in body fat I'd ever been in my life. So I was, I was not a happy camper by any means. Um, and I do think, like I said, there should be some awareness of the competitor and some preparation and thinking about, okay, well, what's my game plan for this? And how do I, in stages, uh, kind of come back to normal eating patterns? And that's very much what you see in anorexia recovery, uh, is there's this kind of refeeding period. Uh, and it comes along with both psychological and physiological stage uh, stages of trying to help the person recover. And not that they're the same. They're absolutely not. But they, there are some parallels. I don't think we can, can, can deny that. So the reverse diet, I think, in its most extreme form is probably... Uh, not helpful and different, differently bad, <laughs> but it did absolutely start as a way to prevent these post-contest huge weight gains that happen for some people, which would actually mess up their next season. Because, you know, in 2008, I spent half of that off season trying to diet off all the weight I'd regained from competition so that I could actually feel justified in, in, in going through a weight gain period. So I, I can absolutely understand the impetus, and I do think people had positive intentions, um, but what it became was almost this, uh, this, this like catering to eating disorders and the state, the phys physiological and mental state that you get into post contest, where you just get overly focused on being lean, uh, and and you're all about restriction and control. Uh, and I think it's a terrible environment for actually improving your physique, and certainly a terrible environment for getting back to, uh, you know, having a healthy social life uh, with with your family and loved ones, uh, or even just a, a healthy relationship with food. So, you know, there's no avoiding uh, the stresses during the contest prep period. But I think if we want to get someone who's a competitor back to the ability to gain muscle and the ability to have a healthy, balanced social life so that they're not super stressed, again, if you want to just look at it from the performance perspective, I'll be reductionist with you. Being super stressed out and having all these disordered patterns of food, not great for putting on muscle, not great for being focused in the gym, not great for being willing to put yourself into a surplus and you know, gaining weight at a steady pace to have this constant anabolic signal, but instead you're having like these 5,000 calorie days, 2,000 calorie days, 5,000 calorie days, 2,000 calorie days. So yeah, um, so however, however you wanna look at it, reverse dieting, really not ideal. It doesn't match up with physiology. Um, you know, suppressing body fat and keeping body weight only slowly going up is not fixing metabolic adaptation, considering a lot of the stuff seems to be related to the, weight, the lost weight itself. So the recovery diet, uh, and, and I can proudly say that, that I think we started coining that term at 3D Muscle Journey, um, was our response to the failures of reverse dieting. And the idea was, again, to focus on recovery. And it was the purposeful increase to a large surplus uh, immediately after competition, larger than you would have during the peak of your bulk uh, in the off-season, uh, for the purpose of not only restoring the lost muscle mass um, and the lost sanity, 
uh, during the contest prep period, but, but to restore lost body fat on purpose. And I think that's, that is just a huge kind of mentality shift. Um, you get so focused on staying lean, increasing calories and being able to eat, but maintaining all this, you know, change to your physique that you work so hard on. But when you're a competitor, you have to really embrace the fact that you're not getting lean because it's awesome. You're getting lean to compete. And if you want to be successful in future competitions, you need to let go of this highly precarious, physiologically suboptimal state of being really, really, really freaking lean. Uh, and this goes back to you know our P ratio discussion. That the one thing that nobody disagrees about, even though the goalposts have changed, is that the worst place for gaining muscle is right after competition for competitors. So, um, so yeah, it, it's it's not you know having like castrate levels of testosterone is not ideal <laughs> for for building muscle, which is not an exaggeration. There are case studies showing people drop to one fifth of their normal hormone, uh, hormonal production uh, once they get into stage shape. So how do we do this? You know, our basic recommendations are to get into a pretty sizable surplus. We're talking 800 to 1200 calories, you know, so you're gaining, you know, a solid one to two pounds a week uh, until you get up to what I described earlier is kind of the bottom end of your settling point range. Um, and we normally apply this with that outcome as the goal instead of like a specific increase in macros or decrease in cardio, because some people do a lot of cardio. Some people do very little. Um, so if you're someone who's leveraging a crap ton of cardio uh, and eating, you know, in, in a small deficit, we might just cut out all your cardio or cut it in three quarters with a small bump in calories. Uh, if you're only doing a couple cardio sessions, cardio is gone and you're eating, you know, 800 more calories. But ultimately, where we'd like to, where we've anecdotally seen people respond best is by getting about five to 10% over their carved up stage weight in, let's say, one to two months tops. And the difference in the success rates that we saw when we were doing reverse dieting, let's say 2012, 2013, uh, versus the recovery dieting, recovery diets, which we've been doing for the last six, five, five, five to seven years, I'd say, is, is striking. Uh, because when you tell someone who's been on 1,800 calories to go up to 2,000 calories, uh, they appreciate the bump because it's the first time they've had a bump probably in months, but it is really the same and it still sucks and it's hard to justify. And when you are restricted and you go off, you go off. You know, people don't go, I'm going to binge and have half a cookie. No, they, they have a whole pizza and then keep going until they feel sick. Um, but when you tell someone who's just been on 1,800 calories to go to 3,000 calories, that is a very different mindset, especially when you tell them, hey, we're going to be tracking a little less strictly. I want you to feel comfortable going out. Uh, and behaviorally, we're going to try to get back to eating like a normal human. So have three normal-sized meals. Have dessert, though. You know, it's all good. We actually want to gain some body fat. We want to do it at a healthy pace. We don't want to binge eat, but, you know, go for it. And when people would mess up on the quote unquote mess up on the recovery diet, you know, they might look up and go, you know, I think I had closer to 3,500 calories. And our response is not, how dare you? You ruined the plan. You're paying me to tell you what to do. And you're failing. You're fired. No, not at all. Our response is thinking back to 2013 when we told someone to eat 2,000 calories and they had 6,000 calories. <laughs> And now we told them to have 3,000, they had 3,500. Like that's a win, uh, no matter how you dice it. Yeah. Um, and we saw people giving themselves permission to, to be human post-competition. Uh, we saw people not having the same kind of, ah, God, cyclical self-hate that they would see every time their, their, their willpower broke after kind of building th themselves up on how powerful their willpower was. I think people like that self-identity gets threatened when, when they can't control their eating after doing it so, so effectively. You know, you have someone who just got their pro card, like I'm a professional natural bodybuilder. And then that, like next week, they're like, I am a child who can't stop eating candy. You know, like those are tough things to, to hold in your mind. So the uh, giving people that, uh, that, that structure, which doesn't force them down to a nearly impossible physiological and psychological path has been so much more successful. And that's not to say that people aren't struggling post-competition. They are, but it's expected and it's catered to uh, rather than denied and tried to, uh, to be, you know, railed against at only delaying their success later in the off season. Eric, you're crushing Omar. this. There, there, there is so much to unpack. No, truly, because what, what people don't know, like I said, is that we came with this episode 
my man's firing on all cylinders, taking everyone on a journey. I think it's been exceptionally clear what you've said. Um, I do wonder, so first, I think the intentions were completely noble with reverse siding. You see a problem, you're trying to take a look, okay, what does literature, uh, literature say? Is there anything there? There's nothing there. Well, conceivably, what could be potentially the solution? Well, let's start uh, stepwise. As you said, from 1,800 to 2,000 calories, someone that's been dieting for eight months, they're probably like, wow, thanks. But, but it was a learning process that then led to something that was more effective. I do wonder, Eric, because we always equate willpower, discipline, all these things uh, with, you know, good virtues. And when one fails, is it can those two thoughts coexist at the same time of how you view yourself? I'm a natural bodybuilding champion. I can't stop eating candy afterwards. I'm a child. Wh which one is my reality? And it's almost like you want to give someone the opportunity to win. Any scenario that you're placed in, you want it to uh, be a situation where a win is there's some sort of pathway to victory. And I do wonder, just uh, very briefly, the influence then on uh, of social media on competitors and people that display their journey, because it's almost like this exalted, noble suffering that you go through, like, look at me, look at what I've sacrificed. And that's kind of a, a way that we evaluate things. If something looks too easy, even if it's a PR, you didn't try hard enough. Like someone can hit a 30 pound PR on social media, why didn't you go up and wait, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't enough. We, we are making these offerings to the masses of ourselves. And so we're exalted once again in our own suffering. And so when someone diets down, looks great, and then they have to have these internal narratives to justify why they're gaining weight was well, not what I wanted, but I'm, you know, uh, uh, going to get better because once again, you're being judged by a jury of your peers. It kind of probably compounds the issue because now you're coming to a realization about yourself or what you're going through uh, and then you're questioning the reality of things of how you view yourself what people are saying oh like that guy eric or that guy omar like they lost weight but <laughs> i saw that gain the weight right back guess he didn't have it in him right and, and so it, it maybe can uh compound or emphasize uh some of these situations so i, I love how you explained that for a competitor an actual competitor someone who's gotten to unsustainably low body fat levels for a specific function winning that their competition it becomes a necessity then to gain the weight a, a recovery diet is an extremely viable strategy then we're uh, gaining some of that weight maybe that uh, uh, extra adiposity uh those things those uh, hormonal pathways uh, kind of being restored them feeling that they're not uh, potentially depriving themselves all, all, all those things are going on eric what then is the situation? And I like how you said it. It's like it would be arrogant of me to assume it's like, hey, one, two, three, like you just dieted down. Here's what you got to do. It's not a recovery diet, but uh, here is the situation. What can we kind of reasonably extrapolate then, um, if anything at all, from these competitors that get exceptionally lean and then the utility of something like a recovery diet? How then can we take from you know a microscope of a very specific uh, niche population and then expand it out then to the masses? So for the people, the individuals then listening, because I love uh, you know often in science you want to prove a thing's a thing. It's like okay, we can say in this specific situation, given these variables, here's a potential outcome. Here's what we can do. Let's now attempt to generalize without losing the fidelity of the information. Where do we go now for the masses? That's a great question, and um, I think. Something that people perhaps don't realize is that um, the application of physique sport to, to, to the general populace of people who are interested in like body modification, I don't, I don't mean tattoos or, yeah. or, uh, <laughs> or piercings, <laughs> I know very little about that. I have some tattoos, but yeah. um, you know, like aesthetics, people who want to get empowered by sculpting their physiques to be more muscular, which 100%, I'm all about it. Yeah. I'm still going to be lifting when I'm, when I'm no longer a competitor for that reason. Um, they actually don't apply much at all. Um, some basic things do, like the concepts of how to train uh, and the off-season nutrition practices of bodybuilders, 100% applies. But exactly what you said, the necessity of competition and getting so lean means the purposeful regain of, of body fat and body weight, which is antithetical to what people are trying to do outside of competition. Most people are trying to lose weight and body fat permanently. Um, and not only are they looking to bodybuilders as the standard of what like a really, really ripped physique is, but if they are looking at that as the standard, that means they are putting themselves in a position that they can't maintain it. So that is the first error that one would make is thinking that stage lean or anything even approximating it is something that can be maintained. 
Uh, the second mistake is to think, well, what do bodybuilders do post-contest? And to consider, you know, recovery or reverse diets. Is this something I need to do uh, when it is all for the purposes of dealing with the realities of getting to an unsustainably lean body fat percentage? So that means that if you're not going to be dieting to an unsustainably lean body fat percentage, which I wouldn't recommend for anyone who wants to sustain a certain body fat percentage, <laughs> is that the, the, the strategies afterwards need to be wholly different. Now, what they should look like um, are, are potentially, ironically, a little more like the reverse diet. So the idea here is that you're getting to the low end of your settling point range. So let's take, let's take, uh, I'll take myself. I think I can probably hang out uh, between 195 up to as heavy as 215. Uh, 215, I'm never really that interested in food, but if I kind of habituate eating higher calorie items, um, I, I can do that, you know, and that, that might be, you know, fun for trying to hit some PRs and at the peak of a bulk or kind of the end of the runway before I go, I need to clean up a little bit. While on the other end, 195, it's probably not a great place for performance or a great place for building muscle, but my blood work looks good. I'm not that food focused, um, but I'm only not that food focused and I'm fine if I am uh, attentive to how I eat. If I keep good structure, my fruit and vegetable intake is nice and high, my protein intake is high, I keep my step count up, I do all the right things, but I'm pretty much totally within the normal range of physiological functioning without any compromises in those ranges. Um, so yeah, I think if I was a non-competitor, um, and I really wanted to just maintain like my, my peak but sustainable physique all the time, I would be, you know, walking around at 195. However, I compete at like 20 pounds lighter than that, you know? So I think that's what people are missing, that 20 pounds over a truly shredded stage condition is still a really good looking physique on someone who's six foot. Um, now that, that will obviously scale differently if you're a five foot four female or if you are a five foot six male or, or, or whatever your individual um, characteristics are. So, you know, there is, there is an equivalent. I can't state definitively where you should be necessarily. But the trick is, is that it doesn't really matter what body fat percentage you pinch or scan at. It's the body fat percentage that you can get to once you restore your calories to roughly maintenance and you hung out there for a little bit that doesn't result in constant food focus. It should feel sustainable. Now, with that said, what feels sustainable is not just tied, like I said, to body fat percentage. It's not the set point. There is the behavioral concerns. So you can manipulate your, uh, your, your choices, your lifestyle, your environment, uh, and, and change your habits over time so that you can hang out somewhere on the different spectrum of that settling point range. So I think that is what needs to be focused on for the general population. And this is where we go back to the whole metabolic adaptation concept. If you are someone who's lost, say, 30 pounds and you've gotten to, let's say, the low end of your body fat settling point range, you are going to experience some food focus. Uh, you are going to experience that drive to eat. Uh, and you are probably going to have a suppressed energy expenditure for the adaptations that I talked earlier. Probably not to the same degree if you dropped another 20 pounds, uh, but certainly your maintenance calories will be a little bit less. Uh, not certainly. In most cases, your maintenance calories will be less than predicted. So that means from a numbers perspective, I think it's been boiled down to, hey, make a conservative increase to about 90% of what you think maintenance would be, and then see what happens when you hang out there, and then do a slow reverse diet, like increase 50 calories a week until you start gaining weight, and then back off a little bit, and that's your maintenance. Now, that's great from the perspective of finding the number that's your maintenance, but the problem with the idea of finding your number that's your maintenance is then you're assumed to have to track macros or track calories to eat at around maintenance all the time. And as we talked about numerous times on Iron Culture Podcast, tracking for life is, is not really sustainable. Um, and doing it can potentially uh, get you a little more dull to the senses of your body, aware of what your satiety uh, and, and, and hunger signals are like. And it's not really natural just to have a, a steady intake of food every day because you don't have a steady energy expenditure every day. And if you were just to track, you know, quote unquote, free living humans who are sustaining body weight, body weight uh, not only does their energy expenditure go up and down, but their energy intake goes up and down, not necessarily to directly couple with energy output, but at least over time, you will see a stable body weight means that it, at net, it balances. So... Then the question becomes, well, all right, well, what are the behaviors of people who sustain lost weight? Also, what are the behaviors of populations and people who tend to not gain weight over time? And there's a number of things that relate to that. 
Um, and some of them are a challenge, especially now in the modern world and with COVID. And we've talked about a few of them. So for one, being sedentary in and of itself seems to be a problem. Most people just look at the energy output side of it. Um, but not only that, there is data to suggest that it dysregulates your hunger and satiety responses to meals. So people who have, uh, who have a sedentary lifestyle are more likely to gain weight. Um, and they're more likely to have health consequences and metabolic dysregulation, even in the face of exercise, if their overall lifestyle is still quite sedentary. So some of the things I would recommend is trying to get up, up and around a seven to 9,000 ish step count per day on average, not necessarily every single day. And that's not that crazy. That's being sedentary, working out four to five times a week, and then taking a walk in the morning and a walk in the evening for talking 20 minutes. That's might be all it takes. Yeah. And if you're someone who, let's say, doesn't use their car that much or bikes uh, or, you know, has places they can they can go to or walk or likes to hike, there's a lot of ways to engineer your life to get around this. You know, park at the first parking spot you see whenever you go anywhere, then just walk from there. Uh, people in, you know, freezing cold right now are like, sure, Eric. But, um, you know, not taking the elevator, things like that. Uh, but essentially making a, a, a baseline level of light to moderate physical activity uh, your lifestyle. Uh, and when we see the correlates between weight loss, maintenance, and exercise, that, that probably is part of it. It's not just that you're burning a little more calories from going on a run twice a week and lifting twice a week. It's probably that that activity drives up your overall, uh, you know, hormetic response to, to energy intake. You're able to maintain uh, a better coupling of energy intake and energy expenditure. It's, it's more of the auto-regulation and uh, the internal uh, balance rather than it is just changing that output equation side to match the input. So I think that that's a really big important thing is that while not many of the Iron Culture listeners, but perhaps their clients for those who are trainers, um, they see exercise as an intervention to lose weight, but then they will, maybe they haven't actually thought that they're going to stop lifting or stop doing exercise once they've lost weight, but they certainly haven't thought about, I'm going to be doing this forever. Um, and I think for a lot of us who love lifting weights, the diet doesn't seem sustainable, but the assumption is we're going to keep training afterwards. And that's not the case for a lot of people who are getting into weight loss. They're lifting weights because they've been told they should to maintain muscle while they're, while they're losing body fat. And that's the best case scenario. <laughs> they probably got much worse information. <laughs> so they're doing exercise to lose weight. They're modifying their diet to lose weight. Uh, and then when the, the weight loss is over, there's not a lot of motivation to keep exercising. Uh, and, and certainly they shouldn't keep dieting, but they, they do need to maintain some of, some of those behaviors. So from a perspective of a trainer or someone giving advice to someone else, I think we need to do everything we can to encourage those lifestyle changes, help them find an activity that is something they love doing for life. It doesn't need to be lifting. It would be great if it was, because it's highly effective, uh, at maintaining muscle mass and building strength and, you know, bone density and all the good stuff that, that comes with it for health, especially as you get older and older. Um, but whether it is an intramural soccer league or whether it is going on hikes or whether it is going to the pool to swim regularly, finding a movement practice that someone maintains for life and not being sedentary are two, hu two huge key pieces I would advise. Uh, in addition to that, I think the diet itself should be an exploratory process of seeing what new food do you like or new food preparation strategies. Um, one of the things I don't like about if it fits your macros is it kind of sees food as just a method to get to an output of numbers rather than teaching people skills. Um, one thing I do like about people who get diet plans and get diet books and cookbooks is they, they might actually learn to cook. They might actually learn some kitchen skills. Um, so I think and also a focus on foods, while not always a good idea, if it's kind of that good food, bad food mentality, you get to learn a little more about nutrition and which foods contain, uh, you know, other <laughs> vitamins and minerals and micronutrients rather than macros. So healthy eating becomes a little more of a kind of overall focus rather than, hey, nothing matters so long as I hit my macros. I'm not saying someone shouldn't learn the macro composition of foods, but if someone learns how to cook quote unquote healthy foods, or I should say highly nutritious foods that are low in energy density, high in fiber, high in water content, high in micronutrients, and that also have a protein serving. If you earn, learn how to cook those regularly with less hassle and you enjoy eating them, or at least some of them, and that expands your palate, expands your skill set, that is more likely to stick. So I think encouraging people to explore on their diet uh, how to change their long-term nutrition is a really good idea rather than going, yeah, I'll suffer through my 
you know, like mushrooms and, and kale salad uh, during the diet because I'm dieting, but once I can't wait for it to be over. Um, so I think there's a fine balance to be found between um, what does your diet look like afterwards. Uh, and instead of trying to white knuckle it again, it's that, that opportunity to try to figure out if there are new ways you can live your life. The, the outcome you want is that someone eats more fruits, eats more vegetables, and has a protein serving and a regular food schedule uh, that they stick with for life. Um, essentially getting the energy density down um, and the, the satiety index of foods up, you know, having more foods that, that pack a lot of volume and weight, but not a lot of calories uh, and, and serve the person a lot of protein and a lot of micronutrients is, is really what we want their lifestyle to be. And I think as someone giving advice or a trainer, you need to think about it from that perspective, not just how do I engineer their diet either through macros or food choices to result in a deficit. Um, that's great. Of course, you do need that. But I think the you need to be constantly in their ear with, what do you think about that? How would you prepare this? What would your, 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 your life look like with another 500 calories on top of this, but mostly the same foods with some treats here and there? Help them understand what they can work in. What are permanent choices that are lower in calories that they don't even think about? You know, like if, if they like soda, but they don't care whether it's a Coke or a Diet Coke, um, you know, if they just focused on macros uh, during the diet, they would just go, okay, I, eat, I drink Diet Coke and not think about it. Uh, but when the diet's over, that might be over. But if they think about, oh, I like to have Coke, I can constantly have it. Okay, I'll always drink Diet Coke. Or maybe I don't notice the difference between different yogurts if they're low fat, high fat, or fat free. There's a lot of ways to mix these things in. Or maybe I don't really like vegetables, but I've learned how to cook and I can mix spinach and cook it down so that it mixes into my meals. And it's just something that is that is part of that process. So I think, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's so important. The output of not being sedentary, having a regular movement practice, incorporating high fiber, high protein, high micronutrient, low energy density foods that you do as a baseline without thinking about it will result in this automatic auto-regulation of having a lower food intake, um, which will help one sustain weight loss. So I think you need to get to that. And that can take a lot of different forms. It probably should take a lot of different forms and be individualized to the person. But that's often not the emphasis uh, that the person takes when they're kind of, you know, enthralled in the process of lo losing weight, watching the numbers go down. They're not thinking about the long term. And I think that's your job as someone who might be giving them advice is to really kind of just be constantly in their ear. Like, look, the weight loss part's easy. Most people get that right. Most people don't get the weight loss maintenance right. So, so how do we turn this into it? Which of these things seem sustainable? Which meals do you like? Uh, which of these exercises do you hate? Let's get rid of those. We should be white knuckling only as much as is, is absolutely possible to get to your goal. And then we need to think about uh, sustainability. Someone once said, Eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your flipping vegetables. Um, I am curious, uh, Eric, uh, uh, just to go back temporarily to the recovery diet, because you said with the reverse diet for competitors, I, I meant to ask this and then I uh, did forget where you said, you, you know, just roughly speaking, maybe uh, for competitors, the reverse diet, 90% of people wouldn't be adherent or effectively wouldn't work. Do you have any rough information since uh, you 3DMJ have been incorporating recovery diets, what that looks like just, just before we go back to, um, you know, the, the average person trying to maintain weight loss and those sustainable habits. Yeah, that, I absolutely can. I think, I think it's also the, the reverse diet also kind of assumes everyone has the same goal and it's to be as lean as possible and eat as much uh, food as they can. And that's easy to talk a competitor into, but I think it's probably better to take a client centered approach and prepare them for what they're likely to experience post-competition. And if their goals are ostensibly to keep competing, uh, the what aspects of the physiological state and psychological state they'll be in will be counterproductive to that goal. So I, I am I am not proud to say it, but sometimes the reverse diet was the assumption when it was at its peak popularity. It's like, all right, cool. Just to let you know, you know, once your peak week's over, we're going to go to twenty two hundred, and they're like, oh, okay, I'm glad my food's going up, and then very quickly like, oh, this is terrible. But I, I, yep, this is what we do. This is the best way to to recover our metabolism and prevent the uh, the post contest rebound. And then when you think you're doing what's called best practice and you have the post contest rebound anyway, then you just hate yourself. So it's this terrible combination yeah. of feeling like you failed coach, feeling like you failed yourself, feeling like you're broken. Um, and yeah, it was, it was awful. So, you know, the recovery diet also kind of went hand in hand with us thinking about 
the individual human nature of each one of our clients and being a little more client centered. So, you know, dictating success uh, is going to be a little more in the eye of the beholder at that point. Um, and for some people, it's just not having a big blowout post comp, gaining a reasonable amount of body fat at a reasonable pace that minimizes some of the psychological trauma. And I would say if, if we just look at that, like, are they happy with the outcome? compared to, you know, failing on the expectations that were unreasonably set by reverse dieting, probably like a 70, 80% success rate. Wow. Um, and if we look at like being able to maintain, if we can kind of compare them quote unquote head to head, like which one results in walking around leaner with, with a higher food intake, I say the recovery diet still edges out the reverse diet just because, like I said, if you're told to eat 2,000 and you eat 6,000, you're going to gain more body fat than if you're told to eat 3,000 and you eat 3,500. Right. which is more often what happens. So, yeah, I, I would say the majority of people uh, find a semblance of, of success with the recovery diet, um, with the goal, with, with success defined as not being as emotionally traumatized post-competition and more quickly getting back to a place of feeling like a normal human again regarding their relationship with food and being able to have a productive off-season where it's not about trying to maintain the lost glory of contest prep, but moving forward and trying to build muscle and being okay with their off-season uh, body composition. You know, Eric, uh, someone, a bodybuilder, once famously said, it's not hard for me to give the wrong advices. And I, I do wonder when it comes to uh, coaching or coaches in general, those that uh, give and proliferate information online, if they adopted a slightly more client-centered approach where there's the input of the client the results that they experience, that relationship between the coach and client, and that being informed of, hey, was this the best possible route to go, or can we do better? And trying to develop that over time, where, as you said, I think reverse dieting, start with very noble intention. It's like, oh, I see a problem. We see a problem. How do we fix this? Try it out. Okay, as you said, I, I found that interesting, too, where because now the client thinks, hey, this is the right... So, Normally, I would just, Eric, I would just binge afterwards. And now, hey, you gave me the solution. You got a coach. And, oh, shit. Like, you, you make the mistake. So now, not only uh, is the same thing happening, but now you feel that onus, that responsibility, I let coach down. Oh, on top of that. But I do wonder the overall concept uh, that's spoken about skin in the game. Where like you make a, a prediction or you have uh, some sort of investment. So investors, they're able just to uh, uh, invest others' money and if it blows up, there's no consequence other than they're fired. So they don't lose the $100 million that uh, uh, those invested. They're just dealing with other people's money. If instead they're skin in the game where their own uh, well-being was tied to it, uh, how would they then choose their actions differently? And so if you view the client as being a, a proxy for yourself or a representation of what you're trying to do, and so their outcome is your outcome, not only professionally, but I mean that you want to see them succeed, I think then your choices and recommendations change dramatically as opposed to the top-down more archaic approach that we spoke about before was hey i'm the guru i know what's up any misgivings any incorrections uh, any errors uh, are on the part of the person doing it their interpretation of that which i said not what i'm saying potentially has problems inside of it so what's neat to me about it is that B baked into it is the concept of a continual refinement of the process. And I think I respect that in any pursuit that you do. So it's like, hey, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to have the best possible situation. I'm trying to make sure the client wishes are fulfilled. Okay, let me evaluate that. So it's almost there's an introspection um, that's associated with it and then a, a need for an awareness of the result. So it's not just taking a look at the end result, but then taking a look at the entirety of the process. So now I, I think it's awesome, man. That's well said, because sometimes I think the authoritarian or versus the kind of client-centered approach is almost looked at like a softer versus a harder approach. Yeah. And I think that is, especially in bodybuilding, a really mischaracterization. That's not the important difference between the two. Um, bodybuilding, no matter how you dice it, competitive bodybuilding requires you to white knuckle it. It requires an intense amount of willpower. It requires you to push yourself to a level you didn't think possible and then to keep going. Um, the, the problem with the top-down approach in that is that while that is a near universal experience in competitive bodybuilding for people who are really getting in shape, what that looks like in people's lives is as individual as people are. So a top-down approach from a kind of a guru 
they're getting it right in that you do need to figure out a way to push yourself past your limits. And it is not an incorrect thing to say, like, you're just going to have to suffer and you need to push past it. Just get it done. You know, like that is not an incorrect statement, but it's not necessarily a useful statement. And I think the client centered approach in bodybuilding is saying, you probably know better than me what your barriers are, what your limits and perceived limits are, and what it feels like to try to push past them. I know no matter who you are, you're going to have to push past them, but I'm here to help you figure out how to come out living or some semblance of life <laughs> on the other side of this as you push past your limits. Um, and I'm going to be your partner in, in figuring that out. And it allows one to have a more individualized approach. And like you said, it builds self-awareness in the client. I think some of the more top-down approaches are just, just try harder, which, you know, absolutely you'll have to do. Um, and you will have to try harder, but there's a difference between working just harder or working harder and smarter. Mm -hmm. And that's the process of individualizing it, becoming self-aware, seeing what the specific challenges you face are and what the best strategies are to circumvent uh, the barriers that your life, uh, your psychology, your environment throws up because they are going to differ uh, from, from your coaches more than likely. Um, and if a coach doesn't take a client-centered uh, methodology to dealing with this, they're not actually building up their experience. They've had 100 people who are all doing the same thing. But a client-centered approach has 100 people who he's troubleshooting or he or she is troubleshooting with on an individual basis and now has a deck of 100 cards that they can potentially play next time they're in a, in a tough spot and they have a, uh, you know, a client who, who is struggling they're all going to struggle like that's we've entered like we've, we've entered competitive bodybuilding it's not about a soft or hard approach it's going to be hard yeah the next question is, is what's the best methodology and if you're not leveraging uh, the realities and the individualities uh, of your clients and if you're not setting themselves up to increase their self-awareness so they can better troubleshoot those problems in partnership with you you're not doing a good job just remember you heard it here first it's your fault if it doesn't work out like just hey when you point the finger at the coach, just keep in mind there's three or four fingers pointing right back at you. As the great coaching anthem uh, once started, oh, it ain't my fault. <laughs> just go ahead and look that up. Classic from the 90s. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were about to deliver another lyric. I'm like, I'm going to give Eric a space. Did I do that? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Eric, well, what I like, so one... Previously, a uh, territory not yet explored on the call, talking about recovery diets, talking also about reverse dieting, tying that into uh, other approaches and considerations, both as a coach and then also as a lifter or as a uh, competitor. And even if you don't compete, Eric, is there anything you want to circle back to? Anything that you uh, want to either refine? Because I, so I'll be honest, I think uh, this was extremely thorough, very clear. And there's a clear journey uh, on your explanation of, okay, like here are some working definitions. Here's the historical record. Here's where we were. Here's how we attempted to improve upon it. And here's what we know now. And likely, if we're trying to you know, draw a parallel then to those that don't compete, this is what I'd recommend. So I thought it was wrapped up in a neat little package. But my man, the floor is yours. No, I'm going to keep it like that. <laughs> I, I have a neat little package, and, <laughs> and, and I'm comfortable with that. So that's it. Hey, you're like Christopher Nolan, bro, where everyone wants to do these days where they, have, they need a director's cut. So uh, Zack Snyder, I brought up Justice League. I'm not going uh, to give my thoughts. I'll, I'll just say that a hey, popcorn movies are popcorn movies. There's a, there's a reason why uh, you didn't direct the Batman original trilogy like Christopher Nolan, but he doesn't do director uh, cut editions. That's what I was going to say about you, where it's like, that's it, man. Like I did, hey, nah, I did the presentation. I don't need to add anything on top of that. No, you want me to add, change the score, editing, pacing? Mm -mm. And I respect that. I actually do respect that. Well, coming from the Dark Knight himself, I appreciate that. So, so I will say that we have so much uh, to look forward to in the future. And hopefully everyone does now that they uh, see potentially that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, wherever you may be, whatever journey you might be on for, yes, the people that aren't interested in body recomp or or changing anything there sure we, we might have another episode with uh strong individuals but this is our heart and soul okay this is our compass right here and we're not going to deviate for nobody amen 
Hunk's getting hunky. So I, I will just say thank you to everyone for listening. Go ahead, leave those comments. Go ahead, <laughs> leave those ratings and reviews. That was amazing. I do take offense. So I think say anything about me, cool, whatever. I don't care. You talk about my boy, though. I am one of those people where my back gets up against the wall because I think you need to know what a damn good job you're doing. So when I hear anything to the contrary... I'm going to find out their address, Eric. And I, I feel comfortable saying that online. And I feel so comfortable to say that I know people that know what to do with addresses of people that we want to disappear. Yep. I mean, I'm not going to mince words. No. I'd be careful with those one-star ratings because I know a guy <laughs> named Danny Lennon. Yeah. Who, let's, I, let's just, listen, like I said, <laughs> that iTunes that I logged into was not New Zealand specific. So I just hope that person is nowhere in the whole European area, especially yeah. not the British Isles, because uh, uh, you're you're close to someone who is just looking for an excuse, yeah, to to refine their skills, and that is what we were talking about here: a refinement of uh, coaching, a refinement uh, as a competitor, and a refinement of other skills. So go ahead, leave a rating review. We're back every single Monday. We'll catch you in that next episode.